Pablo. It's good to be back again. Um, obviously, some of you are new, I haven't seen before, and some of you are old. And it is not as old as you So it's good to be back. Uh, this, this afternoon, I, I want to share something with you from the perspective of science. Now, uh, how many of you have read through the book of Job? And how many of you have come across things that you didn't understand and kept on going? Come on, be honest. There are a lot of things in the book of Job that just doesn't seem to make any sense. Is that true? Yes. And you just try to keep on going to find something else that makes sense. Uh, which, it, it's interesting that uh, a few years ago, not too many years ago, I think about three years ago, uh, Stephen Hawkins was uh, transmitted uh, via... Um, uh, satellite over to the um, opera house here and he was interviewed concerning what he thought was the longevity of human beings on planet Earth and uh, he basically said that uh, there's not much time for planet Earth to keep on going and he said that if you don't uh, if you don't destroy yourself within the next 100 years enough technology will be developed so you could uh, send people to different parts of different uh, planets in the universe and therefore one catast catastrophe will not destroy all of us at once. So he suggested that the only hope that you and I have is to get off the planet. Many of you are smiling at that. Uh, scientists don't think it's money. They are really serious about it. So right now they're investing billions of dollars to try to figure out how to get to Mars. Now, the interesting thing about that is this, that even though Stephen Hawkins was initially, did you hear what I said? Before he died, he, had, he then began to believe that there may be a God. Did you hear that? And you can uh, Google that to see whether or not I'm correct. Uh, but initially, he did not believe that, uh, that God was there, and therefore that the only survival strategy was to get off the planet. However, what he stated was true. You must get off the planet, but not the way it suggests. The Bible is really an advance to science. What did I say? The Bible is ahead of science. Uh, for example, let me see if this, uh, uh, if I can get this to operate. And if I can get it to operate, we're doing okay. Otherwise, just push the button on the top, and it uh, looks like it's locked up. Uh, if you have your Bible, thank you. In the book of Job, chapter 1, verse 6, uh, it says there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. I was on a plane, and there was a lady next to me who I asked and inquired, it was, she traveling for, was she traveling for pleasure or business? She said, business. What kind of business? She said, I'm a scientist. I said, what kind of scientist? I'm in charge of all the apparatus pointing to space to see if there's life out there. And I said, you guys are too late. <laughs> she said, excuse me? I said, you're too late. She said, and why so? And then I said, the Bible tells us there's life out there. So I turned to Job chapter 1, verse 6. And I said, that it wasn't too long when you folk uh, did, decided that you needed to build a, a city in space, correct? She said, yes, you're too late again. <laughs> And then I said, look at the book of Revelation. So I turned to the book of Revelation, and then the book of Revelation, uh, guess what? You know, maybe you want to give me that remote control, since you're controlling it, not me. All right. Uh, and I showed him, that, showed her this verse. Uh, I, John, saw the holy city coming down from God out of where? Out of heaven. And I said, it wasn't too long ago when you focused how to make transparent gold, correct? She said, don't tell me. I said, yes. The Bible says that there is transparent gold. Look at what it says in uh, chapter 21, verse 18 and 21. The city was pure gold like unto clear glass. The street of the city was pure gold as it were. Transparent gold. How many of you have seen transparent gold? How many of you have seen transparent gold? Does it exist? Probably. Of course it exists. The Bible said so. 
Is that true? The Bible says that there is transparent gold. However, just like you folk who don't know that transparent gold, scientists were laughing at transparent gold for centuries. Silly fairy tales. Whoever heard of gold, you can see through. However, they're not laughing anymore. You know why? They discovered how to make transparent gold. In the windshield of the astronomers, you'll see that it's kind of a, a gold, goldish color. That's transparent gold. In the jet liners that you fly in, if you flew here from the Philippines, how many of you are here from the Philippines? Come on, how many Filipinos are here? All right. I was just in Mendora not too long ago. And so, como está acá? Okay, so, anyway, the, uh, uh, the jet liners, the windshield of the jet liners, actually are made of an inch and a half thick, two panes of glass, and in the middle, or sandwiched in between the two panes of glass, there's a film of transparent gold. And those windshields cost about 30,000 US dollars. And I'm speaking about only one of them. Did you know that? So when I said to her, you guys are too late, and I showed her the Bible and said transparent gold, she was amazed. So the Bible is Church. ahead of Science. Come on, folks, you're in a school here, are you? <laughs> All right. So the first anesthesia is recorded where? Where is the first anesthesia recorded? In Genesis. God said that he put Adam into a deep sleep. Now I train doctors. Will I train? Come on, folks. Are you with me? I train what? Doctors. And one of the things that doctors do when they're going to do surgery is to put people into a deep sleep. But well, the Bible doesn't use big words of anesthesia. The Bible simply says a deep sleep. Because God wants even children to understand. Then the first surgery. It says then that God opened up the side. We call that incision. Then it says that the bone was taken out. We call that extraction. Then he closes up the side thereof. We call that suturing. Yes. And guess what, ladies? The first clone. <laughs> <laughs> was who? Eve. 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 So Eve was cloned from whom? Adam. From Adam. So is the Bible ahead? What do you say? Yes. yes. It's just that the Bible doesn't use these funny names that people come up with. God simply says that God took man, put him to sleep, and opened up the side, pulled out the bone, and from the bone made Eve. And for centuries people laughed at that. No one's laughing about it anymore because scientists have discovered how to clone. So the Bible is in advance of science. And I can tell you, if I had time, I could spend a whole afternoon sharing with you all the different things in the Bible that are far advanced to science. But I'm going to share some things with you that we need to consider. First of all, before I pray, notice it says, all human discoveries seem to be what? Amen. Seem to be made only for the purpose of confirming more strongly the truth that comes from on high and are contained where? In the Bible. Herschel happens to be an astronomer. Let's pray. Lord, as we consider your word, we pray that your spirit will guide us. Give us a, a sense that you speak. And we thank you for hearing us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Job was suffering with a lot of different afflictions. Besides the loss of his children, the loss of his house, and all the wealth, and all that he had, he was losing his health. And uh, he was full of sores. In fact, if you Google, it says that his, his skin had worms. If you Google uh, worms in the flesh, you can actually see people with full of worms uh, crawling all over their flesh and all that. So this man was really suffering. He had a lot of questions. And finally, after all the chapters coming up to 38, God finally interrupts and asks questions himself. 
So he tells Job, Job, you stand there, and I'm going to ask you some questions, and I expect a response. And so God began to ask questions. So we go into chapter 38 then, and I'm just going to cite a few questions. Notice the first question. Can you what? Can you bind the sweet influences of Pleiades? Or do what? Or lose the bands of Orion? Can you bring forth masters in the season? Or can thou guide our truths with his sons? These four questions are scientific questions. They're what? Scientific, scientific questions. God is asking Job questions. And I, I'm sure that you have read these questions, but it did not mean anything to you, so you skipped over them. How many of you have remembered, do you remember these questions at all? Going through the book of Job. Okay. And how many of you understood what they were about? A little bit. There's a couple of you. Good. Well, let's, let's study a little bit more. Okay, let's consider the last one. The last one is, can thou guide our tourists with the sons? Who or what is our tourists? Well, it's interesting that science now can explain with the telescopes what and who is our tourists. Our tourists is actually a first magnitude star. There's a picture of it. And this particular star is a humongous star. It is one of its kind that is flying through space by itself. It's not held to any astronomical orbit. So it's free to fly through space. It has been flying through space now for over 3,500 years, at least. Because Job was written about 3,500 years. So this star is still moving. Did you understand what I'm saying? But I want you to know something interesting. Here is it's a star, and you can see the star down, down toward the middle of the, of the picture here. Can you see that? So that star is Arcturus, and it's actually flying at what speed? 925,000 miles per hour. What speed? 925,000 miles per hour. That is fast. Now what's, what's amazing about this star is that it is a, a thousand times bigger than the sun. Our sun is 1,300 times bigger than the earth. 1,300,000 time, times bigger than the earth. And uh, this, this particular star our tourist is a thousand times bigger than our sun. So how big is that? Would you, would you conclude that this is a humongous star? I mean, if, if it's one million, I'm talking about the, the sun, 300,000 times bigger than the earth, and this thing is 1,000 times bigger than the sun, it is a humongous orb, and it is traveling at 925,000 miles per hour. A question. Uh, let's suppose that uh, here it is again. Let's suppose that this particular star, here's the sun, you see that? And here's our tourists, okay? Can you see the comparison between them? Now, let's suppose that uh, our tourists were to fly through our Milky Way. Here's our Milky Way. You see how densely populated the Milky Way is? Let's suppose our tourists zoomed into that. Will it collide with one of the stars? No. Is it possible? Yes or no? Yes. How many of you say yes? How many of you say no? How many of you don't want to raise your hand? <laughs> now, the truth of the matter is that it's not possible from this perspective. The question that God is asking is a, a question that it implies something. God is saying, that, by the way, that's a sub-audition language in the Bible. You know what soft audition is? It is something not stated but implied. In other words, if God says the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God, that is includes sub-audition language, which means that nothing else is possible. In other words, you can't keep Sunday, you can't keep Monday, you can't keep Tuesday. It implies that there's only one day that he considers to be holy. All right? Did you get that? Yes. So, when 
God says, can you guide Arcturus with his sons? What is, is that imply? Who's guiding it? God is. And if God is guiding it, can it collide with something else? No. no. Arcturus right now is right here and is flying in this direction. You can actually see Arcturus with the naked eye because it's so big and so bright. You can't see it streaming across the sky because it is, it is light years away. But it's traveling at 925,000 miles per hour. Now, what is God trying to ask Job? God is saying to Job, Job, can you do what I do? In other words, if I can guide Arcturus with his sons, is it possible, Job, that I can guide your little life? What's the answer to that? Absolutely. In other words, whatever situation you may have in your life that seems to be beyond your ability, God is asking the question, can you do what I do? And by saying that, he's telling you, if I can do this, certainly I can do this. I can handle your life, Job. You can trust me. And I'll take care of you. So can you trust God? Yes. You should be able to. But listen, this fact was not discovered until these magnificent telescopes were invented. The Panama Telescope which can actually measure the head of a straight pin at 200 miles. Here's another telescope, it's called the Hubble Telescope. And this Hubble Telescope is, is just an amazing instrument. And it is through this instrument that recently they could establish the facts that I'm just presenting to you. A question. How did the writer of the book of Job know how to write down such amazing questions? They had to have divine inspiration. Have to what? Divine. Have divine inspiration. Otherwise, there's no possible way, shape, or form that they could have known that Arcturus was traveling at that speed and that was so humongous, all right? Now, they took the Hubble telescope and actually fixed it to a spot the size of a dime at 75 feet. It was just a dark spot. They wanted to see if there was anything out there in that little dark spot, okay? And here's what they found out. The total area of the sky covered in the deep field is equivalent to putting a dime, that's an American dime, you know how small it is, uh, 75 feet away looking at it, that is. In other words, according to Wikipedia, 124, pardon me, 124 millions of the sky, there were 300, pardon me, 3,000 images in the high definition field, almost all of which were determined to be galaxies the most distant being up to 13 billion light years away. Now let's multiply 3,000 by 24 million and you'll come up with roughly 72 billion galaxies in evidence space. And the Bible says that God stretches out the heavens. Who? Amazing what you say. This gives me greater faith in the Word of God and the veracity of what God's Word. What it says is true. All right? If our tourists were to fly through the Scudum Sobieski, that's the populated Milky Way, pardon me, a, a galaxy, again, it would not. Collide with anything. You can imagine what kind of a 
catastrophe would be if that orb of that size would crash into another orb. But it has not collided for the last 3,500 years. Why? My Lord is guiding it. Good news? Amen. 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 Listen. Let me go to something else. Let's look at another question. Can you buy? Can you what? Can you buy the sweet influences of the Pleiades? What does that mean? What are the Pleiades or what is it? And here it's saying, can you keep them together? The word buy means to keep them together. Again, God is asking Job, can you do what? What I do. Now notice, <coughs> let's look at the Pleiades. Most people know them as the seven sisters. How many of you have heard of the seven sisters before? Okay. It's actually not seven stars. They call it seven sisters because that's visible to the naked eye. But in reality, there are 250 stars. These 250 stars are, are actually together. Here they are, okay? And they're actually together, and it's the only group of stars in the universe that are held together traveling at the same distance to the same destination. So God is asking Job, Job, can you keep those stars together? What's the answer? No. Could Job do that? No. But who could? God, God could. So 3,500 years ago, these stars were together. And guess what? Still together. Today they're still together. And they're still traveling together. Who's keeping them together? God. Yeah. God is. All right? So, here they are. You can see how beautiful they are. Uh, here's uh, some uh, support for it. Uh, if you want to check it out, you can check it out. I have the websites here, so you can check me out. Okay? Uh, Isabel Lewis of the United States Naval Observatory uh, said, Astronomers have identified 250 stars as actual members of this group, all sharing in a common motion and drifting through space in the same direction. Lewis said they are journeying onward together through the immensity of space. Dr. Truckler said over 25,000 individual measures of the Pleiades stars are now available, and their study led to the important discovery that the whole cluster is moving in a southeasterly direction. So science now confirms the reality of what God asked. Can you, Job, buy the sweet influences of the Pleiades? Amazing? Amazing, yeah. But we got more. You want to hear some more? Yes. <laughs> yes. All right. These stars are traveling together like a flock of birds going to the same destination. And so, the Pleiades. But let's uh, look at another one. This one is, can you lose the bands of who? All right. Now, please remember, the last one was, can you bind them? Can you keep together? This one is, can you lose them? All right. So, in order to understand that, we have to go to Orion. So, we go to Orion. Orion, basically, is a constellation and... Uh, the ancient Greeks uh, used to look at space and try to figure out what shape it took, you know, whether it be a crab or a rabbit or a bull or whatever. And they thought that this one looked like the great hunter Orion, who boasted he could kill anything, and one day a scorpion stung him on the heel and he died. Anyway, mythology is, is obviously not true, it's just a figment of the imagination, but it helps us to identify the locations of the particular star system. So, how many of you are stargazers? Any of you like to watch and look at the stars? So, do you know what I'm talking about? Some of these things. Okay. Now, uh, here's, here's the actual picture. First of all, I should sh uh, highlight something here. This is the band of Orion. Okay? It's three stars, one star, and it comes back this way. So, here it is. 
And you can see then that you have you have the, the, the band here, and then you have the, the sword of Orion. Okay? So the sword is made up of three stars, uh, apparently, and the other four stars make up the, the belt. Right? The question is, can you what? Can you lose the belt? Alright? Can you lose the belt? So there are several things that are quite interesting about Orion, and perhaps we should highlight some of those. Uh, first of all, how many of you ever remember making the old kites? You remember how many of you made a cross and then got some string, and then I used to use newspaper, glue them with Elmer's glue uh, on the corner so they stick to the, to the string, and then I used to get my mother's uh, skirt or something and tear it up. And, the old skirt, you know, and, and put the tail on it, all right? So here, here it is, okay? That's, that's the belt, all right? And then the sword. You see that? Yeah. Now, uh, the left knee of Orion, there is a star called Regal. And this star is very interesting because Regal is actually a star that is 14 thousand times brighter than our sun. How much? 40,000 40, times brighter than our sun. Is that right? Yeah. So then, uh, of course, there's another particular star up there, and that star is Betelgeuse. It happens to be on the right shoulder of uh, Orion. Now, Betelgeuse, of course, is a thousand times bigger than the sun. So, here's the size of the star. Here's the size of the orbit of the Earth around the sun. And here's the size of the orbit of Jupiter around the sun. Okay. But if you notice, the orbit of, of uh, the Earth around the sun, it is quite small in comparison to the size of the star. But let's make some comparisons here. Uh, how many of you have seen uh, this comparison before? Any of you? But let's look at let's look at uh, something very interesting here. Here's Pluto and here's planet Earth, right? Then when we go from uh, comparing Earth to Jupiter, of course, Earth all of a sudden shrinks down in size, correct? And so here you have Earth and here you have Jupiter. So you can tell that we are really quite a small planet, correct? But now we're comparing it to the Sun. And what's happened to our Earth? Okay, here's our Earth, here's Jupiter, and here's our Sun. But we're talking about something called Betelgeuse. By the way, it's spelled Beltegese, but pronounced Betelgeuse, all right? Now, if you notice, here's our Sun, right? And here's who? Our Arcturus. And what happened to our Earth? Banished, okay? Now, here's Arcturus, and here's what? Wow. Beetlejuice. And what happened to our sun? It disappeared. Question. How big are we? Can you understand why, why David said, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou consider him? When you consider the size of those, these orbs in space, we basically are nothing. And yet, God still is interested in you and in me. And that's a wonderful thought, what do you say? I don't know how many of you have been in circumstances where you prayed and the prayer was answered and it brought to you a sense of awe to think that this God who can guide our truth with his son still is mindful enough to come down and aid us and help us with our challenges. I can serve a God like that, what do you say? Yeah. 
But listen. If you were to have the proportion of size that you have here on earth on Beetlejuice, what size would you be? So, here you are on earth, all right? And here is what you would be like on Beetlejuice. You would be 37 and a half miles small. Your <laughs> circumference of your forearm, that is the circle of your forearm, would be eight miles. How many kilometers is that? Nine, ten, eleven? Yeah, Thirty kilometers. Uh, your leg, the length of your leg would be eighteen and a half miles. That speaks of how gigantic these orbs are. But listen, here's uh, the marvelous thing about this. Okay, here are the three stars, the band of Orion, okay, and here is the sword. I don't know if you can notice something interesting about this, the sword. These are supposed to be three stars. With the naked eye tonight, if you look to the east, you can see uh, uh, Orion. And by the way, I should tell you this, just an added piece of information. Remember the Bible says, every eye will see him? Yes. And people argue, how can everybody will see him since the world is round? What's interesting is this, that you folk down here can see the Southern Cross, but you cannot see the North Star. We who live in the Northern Hemisphere can see the North Star, but we cannot see the Southern Cross. But wherever you are on the planet, you can see Orion. Because Orion rises up in the east. And guess what? The scripture says that when Jesus comes, he comes from where? From the east. So every eye will see him. Will you say amen to that? Amen. Now listen. Let's consider that middle star. It turns out that it's not a star after all. It looks like a star, but it's not. They have discovered something interesting. It is a cave. It is a what? It is a cave. A cavern. An open space in Orion. And that's why it is called the open space in Orion. Now, what's interesting about this open space is that it's brilliantly bright inside. And scientists cannot figure out why it is so bright. What has all along appeared to be a flat surface of nebulous matter in the soil of Orion is shown to be the mouth of a what? Of a cavern of a deep opening receding into the mighty distance beyond. This is Edgar Lucian Larkin of Mount Low Observatory, an astronomer. He continues to say, it is like looking in at a door and to the rear of the cave, deep within glittering nebulosity, the castle is the most beautiful object visible to human sight. Pillars, columns, walls, factories, bell works, stalactites, stalactites, and stalactites are within deeps of deeps. They glow and shine superbly with a, a pearly light. The distance to the rear of the castle from the opening cannot be measured, but it must be three times greater in depth than width or 51 trillion miles. Sirius and Centurii follow with find ample room within this cosmic deep, torn, twisted, and distorted masses of shining gaseous matter adorned with myriads of glittering points, and the whole forms a scene of indescribable magnificence. That this titan mass of pearly light, whence its origin? A 
If it is a cold light, like a luminosity due to the heat uh, as a uh, firefly, then the mystery is beyond any solution to the present power of science. If due to heat, the quantity of heat must be as that of millions of white hot suns. In other words, they don't know what's making the light. Well, I've been to many caves in my life. My wife and I have gone to Rotorua and down in New Zealand, and we've gone to Carlsbad Caverns, and we've been in the caves in Poland and so forth. And there are many beautiful caves on the earth. How many of you have gone uh, into caves? Any of you? No. Okay. Now, there are many, many beautiful caves, but nothing compares to the cave in space, in beauty. The open space in Orion. Is there not some vast mystery concealing that part of the heavens? To me, at least, it seems so. For I can never shake off the impression that the creative power which made the universe lavishes the richest gifts upon the locality in and surrounding Orion. A friend to Garrett uh, P. Service. We'll get us an astronomer scientist. Tennyson wrote a, mist, a single misty star, which is the second in a line of stars that seem a sword beneath a belt of three. I never gazed upon it, but I dreamed of some vast charm concluded in that star would make all worldly things seem as nothing. I wonder what made him write that. Out. Obviously, there's a mystery there, isn't there? In the mind. But listen, what's amazing about all this is that we remember the question was, can you what? Lose the what? The mantle Orion. So let's take care of that, then I'm going to get a little bit deeper into the open space. Uh, presently, this uh, belt consists of an almost perfect straight line, a row of second magnitude stars about equally spaced and of the most striking beauty. In the course of time, however, the two right-hand stars, Mintaka and Al-Nilam, will approach each other and form a naked eye double. But the third, Al-Nita, will drift away eastward so that the belt will no longer exist. Unlike the play of these clusters, the stars in the band of Orion do not share a common trajectory. Which means then, folks, that right now, the belt is being loose. <coughs> Does that scare you? Right now, the what? The belt is being loose. Now, there they are, with the names, see them? And what's happening is this, that these two stars, okay, will finally come up and become a double naked, eye double naked uh, picture. So we have this one here, that one moving, that one moving, and so they will finally lose the Man of Orion. <coughs> now, there's something even more interesting about that open space. In 1848, a little lady named E.G. White had a vision. How many of you have heard of E.G. White? Any of you? Uh, I'm going to make a statement here that perhaps will surprise you. I don't believe in Mrs. White. I don't believe in Peter either. And I don't believe in Paul. I believe in the counsel that God gave through Peter, through Paul, and through Mrs. White. Amen? Amen. Okay. Now, I saw some of you sitting there. <laughs> All right. 
But here's, here's something amazing. Listen to what she says. The Lord gave me a view of the shaking of the powers of the heavens. Dark, heavy clouds came up and clashed against each other. The atmosphere parted and rolled back. And then we could look up through the open space where? In Orion, whence came the voice of God. The holy city will come down through that Question. Question. How did Mrs. White in 1848 know that there was an open space in the Orion? When there were no telescopes with any significance. Divine what? Divine inspiration. Divine inspiration. The same one that inspired the author of the book of Job is the one that inspired that little lady to reveal to us where the heavens of heavens is. No wonder that the space in that hole is so bright. Now you know that Jesus made a promise. Is that true? Yes. You remember Hawkins said you must get off the planet, correct? Yes. Is that what he said? You must do what? You must get off the planet. Without him understanding the Bible, he was citing scientifically what Jesus stated spiritually. Here's what Jesus said. Let not your heart be what? You believe in God? Quote it with me. Believe in God, believe also in? In my Father's house are many. If it were not so, I would have told you. I what? I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will. And that where I am ye may be also. Hallelujah, what do you say? Amen. In other words, Hawking was right. He was confirming the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, he's going to take you off the planet. But rather than taking you on a spaceship, which will not survive in space, he's going to take you himself. That's why the Bible says that your matter must be changed in the moment in the quickening of an eye. Your mortal must put on immortality and your corruption must put on incorruption. In other words, he's, uh, uh, Hawkins was right, but he was wrong in the conclusion that the way to get off is by taking you in a spaceship. It is humanly impossible to survive in space. The length of time that God has said you will be spending in space. According to God, he said you will be spending how much? Eternity. The good news is that Jesus will come and take you. Good news? Listen. I believe very soon the Master will return with his army, according to Revelation chapter 19, verse 11 through 22. His army will come, the angelic host with Christ, and the greatest rescue mission ever undertaken in the history of the planet will take place. Jesus will come to rescue his children. And the scripture says then that when the angelic host comes, he, Jesus comes as a king of kings and lord of lords. He descends down to this earth, but he doesn't touch the earth a second time. It says that we will meet the Lord in the air. And that very verse should be a protection for you that you do not accept anybody who claims to be Christ on this earth. 
He must only meet you where? Yeah. In the air. If you're not meeting the Lord in the air, you're meeting a deceiver. Like the Filipino who claims to be Christ right now. And others who claim to be Christ. You must meet him where? Yeah. In the air. So, then the scripture says that the dead in Christ shall rise first. I long for that day. My dear old dad passed away, 99 years old. My mother passed away. My son passed away. What a great day it will be when Jesus comes, what are you saying? Amen. Those tombs will open up. And the dead in Christ shall rise again. Then the we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the air. And then the greatest procession that has ever taken place will take place. All of earth's righteous will fly off the earth. And according to the scriptures, the earth will get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And then the greatest sightseeing tour of all history will take place. <laughs> Jesus will point out to you all of the marvels out in space. And all of us will just be flying with mouths open. <laughs> Imagine being able to see all the glories that are out there. Listen, their galaxies is just uh, beyond explanation of beauty and uh, the mysteries that are out there. Imagine Jesus saying, uh, look at this one, and look at that one, and what about this one, and what about that one? And so, isn't that gorgeous? Look at that picture. Our hearts will beat fast. Fortunately, we have become immortal to be able to handle it. Right? And we continue to travel. And all the righteous are traveling. And one item after another passing before view. Isn't that amazing? And then finally, up ahead, up ahead, there it is, the open space in the line. And then all the black children will fly into that open space. And then imagine flying through that glorious appearance and finally up ahead. Somewhere in the distance beyond the city of God, the holy city. Can you imagine pausing Jesus out there, the holy city, when the angelicals inside are shouting for joy, with the angelicals outside? Lift up your heads, all ye gates, yea, even lift them up your everlasting doors, and the King of Glory shall come in. And the angels inside say, Who is this King of Glory? And the angels outside say, The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. What a glorious kind that would be what he's saying. And then finally, finally we come close to that city. And then Jesus opens the door and places a crown upon each head. And then will come the moment of moments standing before the throne of the Father and imagine him saying, Welcome home, children. What a day that will be, what do you say? I want to be there, but not you. What a glorious day that will be. Welcome home. I think all of us will take off our crowns and cast them at the feet of Jesus. Eternity has finally become a reality. Far greater than our joys could ever anticipate. 
will fill our souls. To think that that lasts forever. But heaven will be sad if any of you are missing. We must make our commitment to be there. What do you say? Amen. So I would want to make an appeal to you then. Understanding what God has just revealed to you. That obviously is able to do things that are far greater than we can think. He can guide our tourists with his sons. He can lose the bands of Orion. He can bind us with infants of the Pleiades. But he cannot force you to follow him. You must make that decision yourself. And so that's why the scripture says in the book of Amos, seek him that what? That maketh the seven stars and Orion, and turneth the shadow of death into the morning, and maketh the day dark with night, that calleth for the waters of the sea and pours them out upon the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. Amen. How many of you would like to stand this afternoon and by standing saying, by God's grace, I want to be there. I want to make sure that I'm there. And mother, it's okay, we understand. Your heart is standing. It's your little one that you're holding. Let's pray together. Oh, Father, our hearts are strangely warm as we've considered what our ears have heard and our eyes have seen. We marvel at the things that that your scriptures have written thousands of years ago. And yet, science is now confirming the veracity of your scriptures. Forgive us when we have not believed. Lord, we do believe, but also help our unbelief. And as we stand, we stand in testimony to the reality that we want to be. Among that great multitude that no man can number, standing before thy throne, and hearing those precious words, welcome home, children. So bless each one of us. And help us, Lord, as we stand, to determine by your grace to be there. We thank you for hearing us in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Please be seated.